Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Claridge, and welcome to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. Today, we're going to cover neonatal resuscitation. It's hopefully a -a once-in-a-career event. So we've broken it down to make it easier to remember and hit home some of those key points. NRP follows an algorithm similar to ACLS and ATLS, and many of us would have taken NRP course at the beginning of our training, but those memories have faded fast. Fact is, we don't have to do it that often. The algorithm will be split over two episodes, and today we're going to cover the preparation and initial steps, and then move into the most important part, ventilation. This is the 2015 NRP algorithm. To be honest, I look at this, I see a bunch of boxes, a lot of words, and then my vision goes blurry. No way am I going to be able to recall this in a stressful event. So yeah, it's a bit overwhelming. I found what has helped me is to look at the overall picture. And guess what? It follows A, B, C. The focus is on recruitment of the lungs, oxygenation, and ventilation. It goes from minimally... invasive interventions to more invasive. This makes sense. Some of the things we do cause harm and we want to give the infant the best chance to succeed on their own. To make it simple, we've broken it down into a series of boxes, the decision points, and we'll discuss each of them individually. The last part of the algorithm will focus on circulation, which will be covered in part two. The goal is to have a warm, pink, and sweet infant. As with any high acuity, low opportunity situations, Preparation is the most important, so you're not scrambling when the baby pops out. It's especially important in NRP as everything progresses very quickly, much faster than an ACLS or PALS. There's no question this is stressful, but keep in mind 90% of births are are uncomplicated and require a quick overall assessment, clamp cut, and then place the baby on mom. The remaining 10% almost all just need a little bit of stimulation and a bit of oxygen. A small percentage will require advanced resuscitation. Be prepared for the worst. Start with yourself. Try box breathing, positive self-talk, and visualization. Tell the mother, we've got this. Then assemble your team. Get the RT, if you need it, anesthesia, and pediatrics or a second ER physician. Get your equipment ready. Get the warmer out there, the box of NRP equipment in the ED. If you don't have a box like this, get it assembled in your eMERGE. It might be a good idea to create one. Best to have a checklist to go through and to have it all laid out and ready to go. Get your Miller size 0 and 1, endotracheal tubes with three different sizes, superglottic airway, oxygen mask, your BVM device, IO kit, towels, a UVC kit, and don't forget your scissors and clamp, and the warmer. All right, so the baby's born. It's sitting there in front of you, still attached to mom via the, the umbilical cord. What the heck do I do next? This brings us to box one. Again, let's simplify things. The first thing you want to do is ask yourself three questions. Is the baby term? Does the baby have good tone? Is the baby breathing and crying? Answer yes to all three, then just position the airway, dry with towels, and place the infant on the mother's chest. Consider delayed cord camping for 60 to 90 seconds as there is some benefit. If the answer is no to any of the three questions, then there are a few things that we're going to need to do. Newborns lose heat rapidly, so you want to avoid hypothermia at all costs. If you're less than 32 weeks, your options for warming are placing the infant into a warmer set at 25 degrees. If you don't have a warmer, you can place them in wet, yes, I said wet, directly into a plastic bag up to the neck. There's also thermal mattresses and heating blankets you can also use. Remember not to try towel dry infants less than 32 weeks as their skin is fragile. The target temperature is 36.5 to 37.5 axillary. Next, suctioning. This is an area of some controversy. Our experts recommend that routine nasal pharyngeal and oral suctioning is no longer recommended, even when meconium is present. It's only recommended when there's a complete airway obstruction. If you do suction, suction the mouth first and then the nose. Next, you want to stimulate. You can rub the back, flick the soles of the feet. You can also use drying towels if the infant is well in over 32 weeks. Positioning the infant. Put rolls under the shoulders with or without a headrest. This achieves the following. 
One, it aligns the gabella and the chin plane. Two, it ensures the anterior neck space is wide and open. Three, it aligns the external auditory meatus with a suprasternal notch. Lifting the tongue with a jaw thrust or an oral and nasal airway is essential to minimize upper airway obstruction. You also want to obtain a heart rate, as this guides further resuscitation. You can palpate the umbilical stump, but this is often unreliable. Oxygen sat on the right hand or wrist may work, but it may take some time for it to pick up. The most accurate and effective way is with a three-lead ECG. This brings us to the next decision point. So you've stimulated, positioned the airway, warmed, and now it's time to reassess. First check the breathing, are they apneic or gasping, and next check the heart rate. If the heart rate is greater than 100 and there is labored breathing and persistent cyanosis, then you want to reposition the airway, use a jaw thrust, suction if you haven't, and place an SpO2 monitor to guide further resuscitation. You can apply supplemental SpO2 and then you can also consider positive pressure ventilation. If the heart rate is less than 100, in addition to some of the steps we've just mentioned, you want to start positive pressure ventilation. So, let's review that. There are several different ways to provide PPVV. First, you can have a T-piece resuscitator, a flow inflating bag, and a self-inflating bag. Figure out what your institution has and get your hands on it. For the pros and cons of each, there is a great video in the show notes. Here are a couple key concepts. One, you want to avoid overventilation, as this can lead to pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum. Apply just enough pressure to cause the adequate chest rise or positive inspiratory pressure of 20 to 25. Target a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute. How do I do this? By saying to myself, or out loud, breath two, three, breath two, three. Lastly, you want to avoid overoxygenation. Don't use an FiO2 of 100% to start a resuscitation, as this is associated with an increased mortality. Start with an FiO2 of about 21%. It takes about 10 minutes for babies to achieve normal oxygenation sats, so make sure you have this chart available, post it on the warmer somewhere or on your phone. Take note that the oxygen sats targets in newborns are much lower than that in adults. After about 30 seconds of ventilation, if the heart rate is less than 100 and you're not seeing adequate chest rise, Use the Mr. Sopa mnemonic to remember the ventilation corrective steps you can take. Readjust the mask and reposition the airway. Try suctioning and open the mouth. And you can increase the pressure by dialing up the PEEP to 6 to 8 and increase the positive inspiratory pressure. If you still cannot get adequate chest rise with all of this, then consider an advanced airway. The advanced airway can either be a supraglottic airway or endotracheal intubation. Strongly consider using a supraglottic airway as it compares to a BVM as compared to a BVM, it's associated with shorter resuscitation and ventilation times and less requirement for endotracheal intubation. Remember that you cannot use it in less than 34 weeks and less than 1.5 kilograms. For intubation, you want to use a size 1 Miller blade for term infants and for preterm size 0. It's handy have to have a chart like this one to determine the ET tube size and insertion depth based on gestational age rather than committing it to memory. Remember to get half a tube size bigger and smaller ready. Another way to remember the ET tube depth is with 6 centimeters plus weight in kilograms. If you had video laryngoscopy, it's associated with improved success and decreased rate of complications. What about RSI medications? Although it's not always feasible, it has been shown to improve intubation success and decrease complications. It's easy to remember the rule of twos. Atropine 0.02 milligrams per kilogram, fentanyl 2 micrograms per kilogram, and succinylcholine 2 milligrams per kilogram. Let's review. It all starts with prep. Get your team ready because things progress quickly. Assemble your team and visualize your plan. Ask yourself three questions on arrival. Tone, term, or breathing or crying. If the answer is no, move to warming, positioning the airway, stimulating and suctioning if needed. Next, check the heart rate. If it's less than 100, you need to move on to positive pressure ventilation. If that's not getting adequate chest rise, then use Mr. Sopa for ventilation corrective maneuvers. If the heart rate's still less than 100, move to placement of a supraglottic airway or intubation and attempt ventilation again. Recruit those alveoli and start oxygenation slowly. For the majority of your resuscitations, this will be all you need to do. Check back with us for part two, where we'll get into chest compressions and the use of epi. See you again next time. Thank you.